Hi there, David Mendez here, and I just want to let you know that this week I'm bringing you yet another treasure from the vault. So this week on Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD, I'm bringing you a great conversation about staying true to your life plans with Katya Park, one of the favorites of season two of the show. So sit back, happy listening, and happy sharing. So two things. Uh, when I came home, I was home. That was it. So so make sure I turn that off as soon as I got home. It wasn't really always successful, but that was at least what I tried to do. Um, and the truth is, it was more of a fear of reprisal and a fear of a loss of opportunities. I didn't actually lose opportunities. I was afraid I would. I actually, you know, I remember, you know, going to Quebec. I had I, and I had the kids with me, and I had a, I had the young one. He was just a baby, and I remember, you know, getting an award. And I think less that people were looking at me and judging me. They were like, oh, okay, this is possible. And so I felt that sort of people could see, okay, it is possible that you can do this. And that was a really nice thing to be able to see instead of being like stuck under a rock where I imagined I would have been. Welcome to this week's episode of Papa PhD. Today with me, I have Katya Park. Katya did her PhD in molecular neuroscience at the University of Toronto. She defended when she was seven months pregnant with her third son. Her postdoc was in molecular mechanisms involved in traumatic brain injury, and then she was the director of the neurovascular research team at a private health clinic. Wanting to get a broader broader picture of how things work, Katya left the lab and worked at the Ministry of Health. She currently manages a team of researchers and evaluators at the Ministry of Seniors at the Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility. She misses science though and the conversations involved oh yeah she misses science though and the conversations involved so she and her husband also a neuroscientist have started their own scientific consulting company. Welcome to Papa PhD Katya. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ça fait plaisir. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really glad to have you here and uh, well one of the things uh, that that um, that I wanted to to cover today, it, it's stated in your intro, which is that you defended when you were seven months pregnant with your with your third child. So this means you went through your PhD with two kids already. Yes, <laughs> right. Yeah. We we can talk about that a little bit later, but um, or maybe you can start there. But uh, it it'd be great to give uh, the listeners a little overview of what your academic. Uh, path your academic journey was. Can sure. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I um, started my, I did my undergrad and I took a year off and I went traveling and then I did my master's. Um, and then I took a year and I um, worked in another lab uh, where I thought I was going to do my PhD, but that didn't end up happening. So I came to another lab um, also at the University of Toronto. And it was um, a very big, very successful, very competitive lab. Um, uh, when I started there, I was, um, seeing my now husband and, uh, we ended up getting married and, um, I think probably about midway through, I had my first child. My, um, boss also had two kids as well. Um, and, uh, but other people in the lab, I don't believe anyone else in the lab at that time did have children. Uh, so it was a bit of an anomaly. Uh, and there weren't a lot of people to sort of say, hey, you know, do you have kids? How does this work? But that's okay. I also didn't, because I worked in a fairly competitive lab, I had very much the attitude and like you keep hearing these little things. It's like, well, I didn't ask you to have children. So why do I have to do your experiments for you? So it, so it very much was like, okay, so I have children, but you know what? I'm just going to keep going and nobody needs to know about it and I can keep going. And it actually took me years to be able to talk about them in a professional manner. Um, and I made the not so good decision to take four months off with the first child. That was way too short. And I, he was exclusively breastfed until he was six months old. So my husband would bring him to the lab. And well, there's a breastfeeding clinic and I would go down in the middle of the day, not tell anyone where I was going and feed him. And then, um, but uh, uh, it was hard. It was very, very hard. Um, but then we um, had another kid and, and it was lovely. So 22 months later, our second son was born. And uh, still kept going. I had six months off with him. Um, I was working on a project that I was then pushed a second author on. And that was, that. well, co-first author listed second. And that was 
tricky, but I just, you know what, let it go. I have, I've got these two great kids and that's fine. I'm just going to keep doing the best I can. Um, uh, and the truth is somebody else had to step in for me when, when I was working. So at the time it was heartbreaking looking back. It's like, you know what, it's, it's not a big deal. I mean, yes, you may have worked on it, but so did someone else. Um, um, and I think for many people when they're, when, if, if it's a decision or if they have children, they're like, oh no, I'm going to lose everything. You don't lose everything. You, you still have your publication and many people in the world don't have publications. And, um, yeah, so, so, and, and, and you still, you have these great little kids at home. Um, but the daycare closes at six. So I would, I remember running to the daycare at six o'clock or my husband would, one of us would have to run home to get the kids. And my husband was also doing his PhD at the time and get the kids, go home, make dinner. But of course it's a lab. So things don't stop running. So then you put the kids to bed, you say, oh, good night. And then psh, run back to the lab. And sometimes you'd be there until 11 or 12 and then come back home and then start again the next day. Um, uh, so I often, I get a lot of, I, I would used to get a lot of cold sores every two weeks. I'd have another outbreak of cold sores, but you just keep going. Um, and, uh, yeah, I remember when we were thinking about having another one, my mom was like, please can't you just finish your degree before you have another one. So, um, when we were turning the corner, it's like, Oh, it looks like I'll be able to finish. That's when, um, uh, we got pregnant again. And I actually didn't tell anyone in the lab that I was expecting. I mean, it was fairly obvious by the time I was about five months pregnant that there was someone growing inside of me. Um, but I was terrified of what people would say because it's like, well, obviously you're not a serious scientist. If you're going to have another baby, where are your priorities? Um, but I'm like, no, I, I, I really enjoy science, but I also really enjoy a family and, and that's important. Um, so... Uh, um, I was afraid of losing opportunities because we did decide to grow our family beyond what most people would grow their family um, in a scientific setting, particularly in a in a in a high functioning lab. But uh, um, we still we didn't feel that our like we we still wanted we were still excited to build our family. So so um, and <laughs> it was incredibly we don't we didn't we don't have air conditioning and I defended in July and it was a hot summer. Um, and uh, it was, it was not easy at all, um, getting motivated to do, to, to write the thesis. I mean, I had some excellent publications and it, that was a really good thing because I think having to A, defend yourself and then B, write a 200 page thesis, um, and motivate yourself to do that. Well, you know, while everything else is going on is tricky, but because I had some truly excellent publications and I'd won some really nice awards. So it gave me the confidence that I needed to just keep going forward. Um, that helped, but it was not an easy feat to finish that. Um, I was terrified of, of it's like, okay, it's, it's just PhD, ABD. I'm like, no, Katya, you can do it. You, you, you can do it. You can finish this. Many people have done it before you, you can as well. Um, and I'm thankful that I did. Um, but, and I remember typing one day and, and, uh, uh, it was so hot. I, I don't, I, I was, you know, barely even wearing clothes because I was, you know, I was big and sweating and someone knocked on the door. I'm like, you cannot come in, <laughs> but, and this is probably more personal than it needs to be. But, but, um, uh, so, you know, I did thankfully manage to hand, submit my thesis. And then, and then I wasn't nervous about the defense because I did have the papers. And the fact is, even when I was preparing the papers, um, I was told if you want to go in vivo, Katia, it's going to add another year and adding another year when you've got a young family is a long time. Um, but I said, you know what, the year's going to happen anyway. And I know the value of having a high impact paper. Um, so I did it. I went for it and I knew it was me that made that decision. Uh, I also knew by making that decision, it was going to put a burden on my husband, who my boss has said on more than one occasion is very supportive. And he is, um, that really helps. But at some point you have to stop taking and you have to make sure you're giving, um, in a, in a, in a healthy relationship. So, um, he definitely took care of a lot while I was finishing that off. But um, so when I defended the, um, the defense itself, I, I felt comfortable being able to answer the questions. And and it was an air conditioned room and I was very big and I was like, please keep asking me questions. This is quite lovely. <laughs> so it was actually, I have a beautiful memory of, of that, that time. It was, and it was so hard to get there, but it was a beautiful, beautiful yeah. thing to be able to do. Yeah, and like you say, you had the articles. You you know you you had you had reasons to feel to be comfortable, or at least to to to, to trust 
that yeah. things were going to go well and to be confident in a way. Yeah. But now, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, no, one, one of the issues I really had, a lot of the people in my lab went off to California or to Boston to do their postdocs. And some of them, many of them get, go on to have academic positions. And I really thought that was the direction for me. And then um, I was, you know, do we move to Boston? And I'm like, you know, we're very close to our families. Both of our families live close by. Um, and uh, the kids spend a lot of time with their grandparents and their cousins. Um, and this is, you know, this sounds kind of hokey, but it's the first time in, you know, a couple of generations that all of us are in the same area. Uh, so it didn't seem right for all for us to hop on and, and go away again. And that was a very, very big decision. And I remember talking to one of my colleagues, she was a postdoc at the time from France, and she's like, Katya, you're not deciding to something between something great and something horrible. You're choosing between some great things. So we decided to stay in Toronto and I did a postdoc in the lab where my husband is. And that was, that was a very good decision. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So th this, the, the point that, that you're, you're touching is uh, personal values and personal priorities. And I think it's, it's a very important one. And uh, you know, like you said, the first, your first pregnancy your your reflex and what you did was to, to to hide it and i wonder whether today this is still happening you know uh, women deciding to get pregnant during phd and hiding it as as long as they can i don't know if you have if you're in contact with people now in graduate school i, I i'd be curious to know if this is still a thing but i imagine because the, the the institution of the phd hasn't changed that much that the pressure for women to wait until they're done is still pretty high today yes but sorry go ahead. But, but what but what you say i think is is very important for everyone doing a phd in terms of um you know not allowing themselves or not choosing to erase part of their almost personality or their life or their values uh because of their phd because it can lead to you know years later to feelings of not being at the right place feeling feelings of having lost you know part of your life or or, or having sidetracked your life project because of this thing of the phd uh, and and i wonder whether you have some reflection on uh, on that on why you know how you because you must you must have felt that pressure of course you you did because you you hid you know, you decided not to disclose for as long as you could that first pregnancy. But um, for people out there with, with similar decisions, maybe not pregnancy, but uh, I, I, I'm doing my PhD, but I also want to, you know, to keep doing, I don't know, scientific journalism on the side. Or do you have, do you have some, some insights or on how, you know, how you reflected on that and what, in, what instructed, what informed your decision to 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 follow your your life plan because you know have you know creating a family is is like it's like the the for me it's like the bigger picture of life right versus versus a phd yes yeah and actually i should say i also worked with um a, a male colleague who also hid his wife's pregnancy he didn't tell them until about a week before she was due because he was afraid he would lose you know opportunities and so it's not just women it's really anybody and it's not I, I can't imagine it's just families it's anyone trying to decide about going outside of the lab and growing growing that way i remember even going to toastmasters i was always very comfortable speaking publicly um and then i lost that confidence in the lab you know every time you go to a unit meeting someone's attacking you attacking you and you're like ah oh. um so i hid that i went to toastmasters so that i could learn to speak again um, um, but, and anything we did, it was hiding. Um, but it, so, but for me, it's like, no, 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 no. The lab is the lab. Um, and you know, people are like, wow, it must be really hard to have a family and be in a lab. I said, you know what? It's probably a lot easier than wanting a family and being in a lab. Um, and so I knew that I wanted a family and not, and not having one. And so I knew, we knew we wanted a family. And I also knew that the earlier, for me, the earlier we had children, the more time the grandparents had with them. Um, yes, and that yes, was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and and so uh, our kids are now nine years apart. We have four boys now. Um, and my husband and I always say, I'm so thankful we didn't wait. And the fact is, if you wait to finish your PhD, then you'll wait to finish your postdoc. Then you'll wait until you finish your first, you know, my assistant professorship. And when is it the right time? And, you know, people say, oh, you can freeze your eggs. Sure. But your back doesn't get any younger. Um, no. Right. Like you don't get less tired. <laughs> Um, so, um, 
Yeah. And like you said, your you, the grand the grandparents get older also. Yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. There's a lot of repercussions to that. Yeah. 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 And and you get older, and those are like that's ten extra years you have with with children, and um, you know. I will say that parenting does change over 10 years. You'll know that mm -hmm. you know this as well. Like you're probably yeah. more patient now, <laughs> but um, I, I don't know if that's just, you know, trying to figure out how everything goes anyway, but you're always trying to figure things out. Um, yes. And, and always learning. Yeah. Day by day. <laughs> because the, the, the kids bring you different, you know, new things to deal with every day. So <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I'll do these mentoring programs with the university um, and women will come up to me ask, and ask later, they're, and they're very nervous about having children. And it's like, listen, if this is really important to you, then then the time is, you, you can't really plan for it. Um, it uh, well, I guess people do, but you, it, the time is never right. When is the time right? Um, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Now a question. When you decided to go for the postdoc, how were, you know, and, and then you already had three three kids, right? Or I don't know if I don't remember the timeline, but so, but it was out there that you you had a family. How was that that uh, yeah that process of getting a postdoc? Uh, you, I know there's, there's probably some networking, given that given that it was in the same lab as your as your husband. But was was there you know? Did you feel um, you know? Did you did you feel that it was accepted uh, and uh, easily? Let's say yes, yes, no <laughs> for the postdoc, yeah. So yes, yes, it was very accepted. It totally was accepted. Um, uh, I did, I did uh, um, uh, have an ectopic pregnancy partway through my postdoc, and my boss was like, okay. "Katya, what are you doing? Oh, <laughs> uh, I thought you guys were done." We're like, "Well, no." Oh, <laughs> so, and when I left, I was pregnant again, and I think he was like, "Well, at least I don't have to take care of that one." Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, um, but, uh, but no, it was, it was, it was accepted. Okay, so so and and why I'm asking is, um, you know, thinking of listeners who might be either in grad school or finishing grad school and thinking, can I start my family at this hinge step of finishing my PhD, starting a postdoc? Uh, you know how how do you find a lab and an environment that's that you know that is where that's accepted, let's say, and and. Where you can, where you, where your family project can can go on instead of being forced to being frozen in a way. Yeah. Well. Okay. And that was part of my decision. Um, one of my colleagues, he uh, moved down to Boston, and he was working at at MIT uh, to do his postdoc. And I was like, mm, I'm not convinced that would work for our family. So finding a place that would work for our family. Yes, it was a much smaller lab. Um, and, uh, you know what, I, I wasn't working with people from all over the world. Uh, and the excitement of that was truly great. The truth is, is I had close, I mean, it took me a long time to finish my PhD. It was just under eight years. Um, and, uh, I had that experience and I'm very thankful for that. Um, if you're going from a small lab to a small lab, you know, you, you might lose that opportunity to go to a big lab where you're working from people with, from all over the world. Um, and, uh, um, so the small lab did help with that. Um, and, and so the competitive nature of the lab wasn't really there. That was totally foreign to, to where, to where I did my postdoc. Um, yeah. And, and so, so choosing the, the Institute, the, you know, high paced versus maybe smaller, uh, and, and, you know, not so fast paced is probably the way to go. Now, uh, the qu there's a question of funding. For you me. said that the, that was for yeah, me. Yeah, for no, me. for you, yeah, for you. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, uh, and I'm thinking for people who. I think the important point is not everyone will will thrive in a, in a very fast paced, uh, high you know uh, high number of publications and maybe large lab. Not not everyone's going to thrive there, and I think the. The important point is, again, depending on what what your values are and of what your ob objectives are in life, maybe, uh, and it can be because you there's something else you want to develop on the side. Maybe choosing the lab accord, you know, in accordance to that, to where you know a lab where it'll have more flexibility, and and yeah, maybe it'll be smaller, but it'll allow you to cultivate this other side of your life, and in your case, it's family. I think it's it's it can be it can be important for for many other people, men and women, yeah. independently. Now, there's a question of, of funding that I was curious about. Uh, you know, said a little bit under eight years. Were you able to be 
you know, uh, to be consistently funded throughout, and and also how how do how do does uh, uh, pregnancy leave or maternity leave work with uh, with uh, PhD funding? Right, that's a good question. So I, I was funded for almost all of it. So because I had maternity leaves in the middle, that's why um, I, it, it, I had about well, ten months of maternity leave in the middle. So it was um, uh, I didn't get penalized for taking such a long time. Um, but uh, um, yes, the way so you don't get paid uh, and you don't get EI. Um, okay, so it stops completely while you're on maternity leave. Yes, I I think my boss has paid me. Um, I think they did. Uh, I know from my postdoc, my I, I I continue to get paid. I don't know if I had funding for my postdoc. Actually, I don't even remember if I got paid. That's a very good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I should know these things, but it was a while ago. Um, mm -hmm. For I think for my first one when it was four months, it was like it, one of my bosses was American. He's like, oh, in the states you only get three weeks. Why are you complaining? Oh um, so <laughs> and okay, you know I... what? It's true. Um, uh, but yeah, I was like, well, it, it's not healthy, and there's many reasons for that. But uh, um, but the funding does stop. So it's up to your super. Actually, that's what it was. The funding stops, and it's up to your supervisor if they want to pay you for the time when you're away. And you don't qualify for EI because you don't have a T4. You have a T4A. Um, um, yeah. So I believe. Then, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And then when you resume, it picks up where, where yes. it left. Yeah. Okay. That's right. That, One of my grants stopped and then picked up when I came back. That is good to know because it's it, it it means that well, if you, if you can get support from your your PI, you know, it, you know you 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 can stop and then you can continue your, your research after and you'll you'll keep your financial support so I, I think that that is good news now the, the be, it'd be better news if you if you kept having at least a percentage of the pay throughout the the leave but maybe that's asking too much yeah, of the, yeah. Of I, the go, funding. I, I don't know yeah, I, I may have I probably did <laughs> my my postdoc supervisor was very understanding I'm pretty sure I did and I, and I'm, I think I did as well with my with my PhD studies which may have been why my my uh, time was short. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think it's pretty clear, you know, that what the main challenges <laughs> you faced during your, your PhD, it, it was time management, right? And plus potential conflict with with your supervisors or, in, in, you know, or at least at the beginning, fear of conflict or, or of losing opportunities. And th those are difficult uh, to, to deal with because it's true that when you're doing your PhD, the objective is to get published, is to be first author, is to be, you know to to be uh, you know well well recognized in the domain that you're working on. So, um, so I, I think it's pretty clear you you probably went through some of those. Were, were there other impacts uh, or, or other obstacles that that you went through or difficulties during your PhD? Were there habits? Were were you doing something that helped you deal with the, the this this like extra stress uh, of of also having to bring up your family on the side? Yeah. Um, so two things. Uh, when I came home, I was home. That was it. So so make sure I turn that off as soon as I got home. It wasn't really always successful, but that was at least what I tried to do. Um, and the truth is. It was more of a fear of reprisal and a fear of a loss of opportunities. I didn't actually lose opportunities. I was afraid I would. I actually, you know, I um, uh, remember, you know, going to Quebec. I had I, and I had the kids with me, and I had a, I had the young one. He was just a baby, and I remember, you know, getting an award and 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 and, and I think more less that people were looking at me and judging me. They were like, oh. Okay, this is possible, and so I felt like I could. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't say I was a role model or anything, but sort of people could see. Okay, it is possible that you can do this, and that was a really nice thing to be able to see instead of being like stuck under a rock where I imagined I would have been. Um, and uh, the other thing, I now I I I, I will say I'm 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 fairly religious, so I'm I am Christian, and that for me, taking Sunday off was very important. So I made sure I did not go in on Sundays, and that was hard because, <laughs> um, and so you know, and you know whether or not people choose that day as Saturday or Friday or whatever day they choose, but it actually is a very good thing that I've continued um, to make sure that I 
I, I take that one day so that I, I can refocus because otherwise, if the only thing you're doing is work, that's all that matters. Um, and so it really would recenter me, which, which helped me a lot. Yeah. And in the life sciences, it's really easy to have something happening every day of yes. the week. I, I, I definitely lived, lived through something like that <laughs> with the, with the you know, mice and rats uh, being born at different days, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, and and I, I and I think it's really interesting what you say of keeping this day off because it also it's kind of a reset, like you said, but it's also it's also I feel that it's also um, a way of keeping control, you know, of saying this is my life, uh, and and because you can easily while doing a phd fall into this rabbit hole of being there every day all hours hours of the day and then you wake up five or six years later and you don't even remember what you you know what you lived except the phd and having a day off I've, it's funny i've, I've, met, I've met someone else uh, he, i've interviewed someone else uh, and and uh, he he um jonathan weitzman he's jewish He's in Paris, and and he for him it's Saturday, and he said I never worked one Saturday during my PhD, and it's kind of the same same thing that you're saying, and I it's it's really it sounds really simple, but I think it's a really strong decision, and it's uh, it's uh, empowering in a way. That's what I was kind of looking for. You because there's so much pressure to be there all the time, and the fact that you say this day is mine, I think it sets psychologically. It sets you up for for more autonomy and 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 to be more empowered versus the the PhD having power over you. I I really like it. <laughs> now, um, so we've talked about during the PhD, we've talked about about the funding, and I think this is good news. This means that you know if if you okay, I I know actually what I I wanted to ask. Do you think there something in your lab made it uh, compared to other labs that you might have known? made it possible for you to to still uh, perform and still uh, in, even though you were afraid of losing opportunities you know that you didn't was was there something particular about your supervisor or about the people in the lab about the culture that 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 was conducive to you as a woman who wanted to have a family to still thrive in that environment <laughs> um well i don't know if it was conducive but it certainly would work um it's competitive uh and so if you just floundered you were gone. Um, so you needed to keep up. Um, and, uh, um, uh, so, and it, for, it wasn't so much, I'm better than you. It was more like, well, if you don't do your work, someone else will do it. And I loved what I was doing. These were, I, I really enjoyed what I was doing. So <clears throat> if I wanted to be able to continue with it, I needed to step up. Um, so it, it didn't matter that you had little kids at home and it didn't matter that you were, um, you know, leaking milk. You had to just Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this makes me think uh, because you were talking about the importance for you to have your kids at a young a young age, and I think th there's two there's two it's a kind of a two pronged uh, thing. It's you, yes, you're having a, your kids at a young age, but you're also doing your your PhD at a young age, so that you have more energy to. You have, you have more energy to to, uh, to yeah. give to both projects. It's true. It's true. <laughs> so so start early, start your PhD early and then also have your kids early <laughs> if if that's what you want. <laughs> um, also, did did you cross paths during grad school with other women who who kind of stayed in that space of more fear and of oh I'll wait and. Uh, you know, I don't know if you had conversations about this. Well, I guess at the beginning, no, because you you weren't disclosing it. But eventually, was it was it something that was discussed with other women around you that who, who were graduate researchers? One, some of the conversations I had weren't so much waiting to have their children. It was um, some of the postdocs they wanted to have children, and they were either didn't have a partner or, or weren't able, or were having trouble conceiving. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, or even some of the technicians as well, they, you know, they, they were going through, uh, actually there were several going through fertility treatments, um, or not having children. And I was, um, very thankful that we didn't have to do that. Um, I know that we were, you know, yeah. So 
but um, uh, that that was something that was very real. Um, um, and uh, yeah, so but I don't I don't remember having conversations with people saying no, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait. Um, uh, yeah, it was more like okay, now I'm trying to have children. We did have one family who they came from Japan and, and they already had three kids. And when they moved back to Japan, they had another. And I was like, oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Which is very rare in Japan. But, uh, but yeah. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, in Japan, I guess it's more small, smaller families. Okay. So I, I think for me, what we just talked about is inspiring in a way as to, you know, to it makes me think that. Uh, Today, you know, some years have passed since you've gone through grad school. I imagine things uh, in terms of um, equality and gender equality, I think, have improved. At least it feels in society that they're more talked about than they were in the past. So I imagine they have improved. And so I imagine also that today, especially after listening to, to your you know recount of, of what happened and, and how things went for you, that women who are now in graduate school but also want to start a family, I think they can be, conf you know, they can feel that okay, this is something I can do, and and that their uh, their priorities, their personal priorities, uh, are something they should not put in the back burner, and and that you know take that break and then resume your research after if that's what you love, and you can succeed in research. Yeah, well. <laughs> um... And actually, what happened with my fourth child, I took a year off and realized, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, That's and where so, I was going to go next. That's yeah. perfect segue. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know if it's because I had, by the time I came back, I was just about to turn 40. Um, and, and, and like, so is this a midlife crisis or, or is this because I took a year off now at this point? So I, after my postdoc, I, I got a position in a lab. Sorry if I'm jumping ahead. If I, I got a position. No, no, no. Lab. It was okay. exactly where I was going. Okay. So it's perfect. <laughs> um, and uh, um, uh, working as a scientist, doing neurovascular research, which is exactly what I wanted to be doing. It was wonderful. And it was through a colleague of mine. She was a, post, uh, a PhD student. We did our PhDs together and she worked um, at this lab. Um, and she said, Katya, like, would you be in what are you interested in next? I said, actually, I've looked at how myelin and neurons interact. I'm, I'm really interested in now looking at how. And then during my postdoc, I looked at how vascular cells and axons interacted. And it was great. And I'm like, I'd really like to be able to continue that. Um, and she said, well, that's exactly what we're looking for. I said, fantastic. So I, I, I came pregnant to work there. Uh, they didn't know, but it was a fertility clinic. So I figured they couldn't really get mad at me. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, and because it was a job at this point, instead of being a postdoc or a PhD, um, I, uh, I did, I did take the one year maternity leave and, and um, uh, and it was lovely. It was a really nice time. I also realized I do not want to be a stay-at-home mom, and I do not, and I really enjoy being at work. I'm a much better mom, wife, parent, person when I when I go to work. Um, so, uh, but I realized I was no longer. I came back to work for a while, and I'm like, I'm just not interested in these questions. I I I I, I remember having a conversation with someone, and he's a, you know very 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 successful architect, and he's like, what's an axon? And I'm like. I have spent years of my life studying axons and beating myself up, not knowing which protein interacts with protein in a pathway and, uh, you know, feeling like I'm an absolute idiot for not knowing these things. And so many people don't even know what they are. I think there's more. I think there's more that I'm missing. Um, and so I kind of felt like I came up for air and said, it's time. It's time for me to do something else. Um, and uh, that's when I decided. Um, and and I, I also was completely done with cutting off heads. I could not cut off another rat or mouse head. I was done. <laughs> My yeah. I look back and I have the same feelings like I don't ever want to do this again. Yeah. 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 So um I studied uh, olfactory olfactory epithelium. So ah, okay. okay. Development. Yeah. So uh, yeah, a lot of different stage embryos, etc. blah 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 blah. Yeah. So and the, yeah. <laughs> And so I, I said, I, I'm done in the lab. Um, and I had a technician as well. And my mom was like, well, maybe what happens if, you know, you get someone else to cut off the heads? And I'm like, I don't know that that'll work. She did. And I'm like, yeah, no, still not working. I, I, I'm, I'm done. Um, and, uh, and, I, and so I, I, I left. I, I was deciding between going to the bank because that's a logical conclusion. No, it's not. Um, I, I, uh, consulting. Thankfully, I didn't get a job there because that would have uh, meant leaving, you know, four 
four out of five days a week away from my family. Mm-hmm. Horrible idea. Um, and the government. So the only place I got a job um, was working sort of at the in-house consulting team for the Ministry of Health, which was wonderful. Um, I remember like feeling like Adele song, Hello from the Other Side, when I first started. It was like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> but, um, this is where I belong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, well, it, it, for now, it, it was where I belonged at that moment in time. It was, it was what I needed, actually, to give me a, a much broader perspective. I'm like, why are there war- wars in the world? I didn't know these things. I had spent so long looking in through a microscope. Um, and uh, so it was, and to get that job was not simple. So I applied for many, many jobs. I would probably say about at least 90. Um, and what I would recommend is having a resume. So when you leave grad school, you have a CV because that's what mm-hmm. you've looked at your whole. It's you know. pages long. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I enlisted to help of friends of mine um, and even acquaintances. So people that, you know, we would know each other on the street. We'd seen each other at parties, but we didn't really spend a lot of time talking. Um, um, and I said, listen, I really need your help. I paid them with banana bread and wine and, and thank you cards. But that was it. Um, I said, this is my CV. I need to turn it into a resume. Um, and it took a long time and a lot of work. And like, I have several nature publications, um, and I had to like cut those off. I almost cried the first time I did it, but I'm like, it doesn't matter. So you just, you, you put it all down to like a short little phrase. Sorry, I'm going to, what were you going to say, David? No, no, no. I, 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 I was just, oh, okay. uh, yeah. acquiescing. No, no, I, I, I love it. And, and this, this feeling of, of, of sadness or almost despair at removing <laughs> publications is something I've, I've heard about and, and there's, you know, there's this, um, kind of separate, it's you're separating from this other life yeah. completely when you do that. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but the resume, I, for sure. So, so you had people help you kind of, uh, distill your CV into something that made sense for, for employers. Yes. Yeah. And also before I left, so I was promoted from scientist to director and I'm like, sweet. I have a job title that people can recognize outside of the science world. Um, scientist is terrifying. What the hell is that? Who are you? Why are you applying for something outside of science? So, um, so that was like, this is part of my exit strategy. I shouldn't say that out loud because maybe people will get promoted, but that was, <laughs> so I, and, uh, um, so I, I, I um, actually bumped into, so I, I'm also a scout leader, um, and I bumped into one of the other scout leaders one day on our bicycles coming home from work, and he was a little upset, and he's like, I'm like, what's wrong? And he's like, oh, I'm looking for someone, I just poached someone from a team's, from a friend's team, and I don't have anyone to replace. And I'm like, well, I'm interested in something new. And he's like, sure, send me your resume. So that night, because I'd been working on my resume for so long and had been rejected from so many opportunities, I had this beautiful resume and I don't want to say rejected. I just had applied, but nobody, I had not even had an interview at this point. Um, and, and I have a very, like, I have a very good pedigree, um, but it was, it was more, maybe I was too qualified. Maybe I was underqualified. Maybe I just didn't have the things, but it is hard. And I've spoken to many people who are newcomers to Canada and I said, listen, this is not easy. And English is my first language. Um, and I know this city and it's not easy. So uh, it is a very, very difficult thing to be able to do. Um, and, uh, um, so anyhow, uh, I, I had an interview with his colleague and then, um, thankfully they took me in and it was, it was great. It was really a good place to go. I came in, so I, I came in as a senior research and senior research and a senior research advisor so, um, okay. to, to the government. And then, uh, All right. uh yeah. I do want to talk about the process of, of, of getting a, a job in government because there's steps, you know, there's this, I know that there's different stages to, to, to getting hired, but uh, you just en passant men- mentioned something uh, being a scout leader. W- were you uh, involved with the scouts throughout your PhD too? Mm, no, no, no. That only happened later. later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because w- one of the things that I find interesting is how people's communities end up often uh, being where they have these conversations that lead to things professionally. And, yes. <laughs> and you just mentioned that you couldn't have predicted that, that conversation, but no. it, it, it's just happened like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and um, yeah, because uh, I, you know, I was, a, I was a scout a long time ago uh, and uh, yeah, the, the, how can I say the backgrounds of people there must be very diverse, right? Yes. Very diverse. Um, and it's actually, that's one of the, I mean, Yes, the kids are great, but also the leaders are great. You have all these different perspectives that are totally different than your day to day. So it's a really nice. It's it's actually very rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, um, yeah, so going back to the process of, of uh, being hired in, in government and um, through conversations I've had, I, I have a feeling that a lot of researchers and young researchers today are getting interested in policy, are getting interested in... Uh, well, in being in within government organizations that are, that are at the interface between society and science, or you know where scientists uh, can 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 have um, a say, be it in science communication or you know or, or popularization of different concepts, it could be around around the COVID yeah. and the virus, etc. There's there's many reasons why today this the this place of scientists. In organizations that uh, that are more higher level and even even government, I think a lot of people are thinking about that. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, you, there was this first conversation, but then what's the process to end up uh, at, in the position that you got into first? Right. So yeah, that's a, that's actually a really good question. Um, the science world and the government world are very very different, but where we have uh, egos and competition in science, we have bureaucracy and layers and layers of bureaucracy. <laughs> and so under and actually I don't want to say I don't want to say egos in in um in science. It's more like there's a lot of hoops to jump through. Like it's just a lot of jumping through hoops. But the bureaucracy is is a big deal. Um, but having a scientific mind is actually very valuable. And I've seen the soft skills you learn in a lab are very translatable. Um, uh, uh, it, it, there is definitely a learning curve to being able to, you know, because everything you do gets, gets torn apart and redone and edited. And, you know, what you actually finally hand in, in the end may or may not get read, may or may not, you know, turn into anything, but it doesn't matter because you're actually realizing you're working all together on something, but you're putting in your thought, which is very different than what a policy, like a, a political science graduate would have. It's a, we're very, we tend to be very analytical, very fact-based. Um, and the other, this is not a negative thing, but I didn't realize that people were afraid of numbers. And many people who I work with are afraid of numbers. And I'm not, I adore working with numbers. Um, and so, and not just in a, in a, in a financial sense, in an economic sense, but also in an analytical sense. And one of the things that we've had to do, especially in my last position where I was working at the at the fertility clinic, we had to be able to translate things to a lay audience. So you know when you're asked on your on your grad uh, on your grants and your um, papers, please write a one one paragraph piece what, describing what your work is. And you think at the time, oh, this is horrible. Why do I even have to do this? Does this make sense? Truly, it is a wonderful thing to do because that is a skill that really translates outside of the lab. Um, and and so. Being able to do that and take numbers and put it in a way that that you know anybody could look at who doesn't really understand how numbers work and and you know, understanding the caveats, understanding where where pieces are because the caveats really matter and we do have a good hold on those and also the confidence to say no we have to keep that caveat in um, because too many people are like well no we don't need it yes we do because we're reporting to the people that we're serving and that was one thing as well I. When you work at the government, you are a public servant. So people I found working in the lab were like, well, you know, I, I am serving, I am providing research to, to value society. You do continue with that in the government. You are choosing to serve society because that is your role. Um, so there is the translation that way. And the truth is, I mean, as horrible as it sounds, we're, we're doing a lot of COVID projects and doing an, and a lot of analytics on the COVID projects. And, and it is very exciting. Um, like, because... It, I know it sounds horrible, but but it, I, I, I'm able to bring my knowledge and expertise to the table and say, okay, well, these these are things that you'd want to be able to measure, and and um, th these things actually matter instead of you know something else. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, they matter today, like yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which often in other you know now we're in a crisis, and of course it's special, but often you're going to be working on a project that maybe has impact years from now. Yeah. And yeah, the fact of, of you know, I totally understand, and and I understand what you're saying too. Of, of it might sound bad, but I, it's totally, uh, totally understandable. It's, it's like uh, why, uh, why were they able to uh, develop these vaccines so fast? Well, because there were so many cases, and they could enroll so many patients in such a short amount of time. And for for them, being able to for for the pharma companies, being able to develop these these uh, vaccines ha must have been exciting in, in the same, in a parallel way too, in a certain, 
Uh, although all of us would prefer to not have this virus in our lives, I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so now, what about um, um, you know? Once, once you, you, because uh, I, I feel that you have, you then evolve to other positions within the government. Yes. So, how, how does that happen? Yeah. Once, once you're you're in there, and also, do you have colleagues who also are scientists? I'm just curious about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, that's a, that two very good questions. Now, getting into the government, um, I, we've heard it described as sort of breaking into a fortress. <laughs> But once you're there, you kind of move around, and it's very normal for people to be in their position for 18 months or two years, um, right. uh, and to go to a different ministry. So. Um, I was in the Ministry of Health for about two and a half years, uh, and then I, I went to the Ministry for Children and Community and Social Services, where I was there for about two and a bit years. Um, and then I came over here to the Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility, uh, and uh, they were um, they were all very valuable in different ways. Ministry of Community, uh, Children's and Community and Social Services was more about analytics instead of I didn't I didn't. I missed the science in that position. I really missed it. However, we also had a dream of taking time off with the children and traveling with them. And we did that. And it just so happened that we went January to February of 2020, uh, January to March of 2020. So we took the kids out of school, took times off of work um, and came home just as the pandemic was unfolding. <laughs> But this one had been a dream that we had been building for seven years. And it's like, no, no, no. Um, this is, and so I knew I needed to have that position in order to be able to make that dream a reality. Um, uh, uh, but in that time, I also really realized how much I missed science and how much it was, and just those conversations. And that's when my husband, I'd also wanted to start a company of some kind doing science communications. And that's when my husband sort of, and I, we kind of went even further and went the next step um, and said, okay, let's, let's really start this. Um, and then just as we were starting it, I was called by an old colleague actually from the Ministry of Health. And he said, hey, are you interested in coming to work with me at this ministry over here? And I said, absolutely, that would be wonderful. Um, and it has been. So we've been building a team of researchers and evaluators to, to you know, do analysis on numbers. And it's been really, it's a fantastic team and a really great leadership, which has been really great. And that's one of the things I would really strongly recommend is, or I don't want to say recommend, but really keep an eye out for is the leadership that makes a huge difference in where, in where you are. Um, and, and, you know, looking for good leadership really does matter and make a difference. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Same thing for, a, uh, for a lab, right? Yeah. Same thing for a lab. Yeah. Uh, and that's why people need to visit different labs, talk with different uh, alumni with, with present members and, and also interview with the PIs, although that may be not so informative but choosing choosing the lab to, to you know choosing a lab that fits with you i think is very very important now one thing that i i do feel talking with you is you love what you do today and that you also feel and 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 you've said it that for many different reasons the the your background in science your phd your postdoc the or the work you developed although you're not on the, you know at the bench uh, <laughs> doing slices of whatever you you still feel very much that that all that all of that is uh, is behind you you know uh, and uh, you're using it in what you're doing today and and people are not seeing you on the camera but i feel that you you have joy in what you do and one of the things um uh, with people thinking of Or, or realizing that sometimes it's a realization, okay, I'm not going to be a professor. This is not, either this is, I don't feel it or this is not materializing because some people try, try and just doesn't materialize. And then there's a, there, there can be a sadness or a, or a feeling of loss of, okay, I, I lost these years of my life and now I need to do something completely unrelated. And I think our conversation, which is, is almost at, at the end, Uh, has made it clear that it's not the case. There's many places in society where you can find a, a position where you will be useful. You will use those skills, although in other ways, and uh, you you will uh, you will be fulfilled professionally and personally, even. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. And um, and it's not just the work you do, but it's it's everything else around you as well. And and being able to make sure that those pieces all fit. Yeah, I had asked you, uh, and but I, I I made the error of, of asking different questions at the same time. If there were scientists around you where you were, ah, sorry, uh, yes, but not not a lot of 
natural scientist. So I, ha I work currently with a uh, gerontologist. Um, um, not very many people from the lab. Uh, in different areas of the government, there would be, but not where I am now. Okay, yeah. but it's it's still interesting to know, and and I think uh, the government, depending on on again your 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 personality and and you know what drives you, uh, it could be very interesting to to be working in the government in different in different domains for sure. Um, Katya, we, I, we really uh, we really don't have any more time. Uh, I, I I think you shared a lot of of uh, interesting. Uh, 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 insights but also you know stories of what ha what happened to you and how you dealt with things and now going you know with time uh, and with your different pregnancies how different it was <laughs> going through them um i i think it's also clear and i just said it that doing what you did is still is possible today and there's potential advantages to to as a, as a woman <laughs> and as a couple even having the kids earlier rather than later and um, so I think it's it can be inspiring for for young families out there who are also graduate students to think uh, to think whether they need to postpone something that might be a priority for them or not. And uh, and uh, I think your case is a it's a very good inspiration to uh, to uh, to not uh, to not postpone something for an endeavor that you know. At the end, uh, twenty percent of people become professors, or you know, maybe not even. And um, and if you over-identify with it, and if you f fall into that rabbit hole too much, at the end, you you may you may have a, you know some grief uh, at having to move out to another domain. And um, and so, uh, yeah, I would say don't postpone important things that are important for you. And uh, and again, they they can be family, they can be an activity they can be uh, art they can be so many different things right um do do you now there's two things again i'm <laughs> i like saying two things but it, it's it's kind of connected is how can how can people reach out to you if they have questions for you and and then do you have some last words of encouragement because a lot of the the graduate student uh, graduate researcher community now is going through this, this covid issue that has Labs closed, universities, you know, hiring freezes. Do you, ha do you have any words of uh, encouragement or maybe advice on what they could do uh, at this time to to still feel that they're doing something useful for their careers and, their f and for their future life plans? Mm. Yes. Okay. So uh, reach out to me. Sure. Um, you you can reach me on LinkedIn. That's mm -hmm. that's probably the best way. I don't know if you want me to like say mm. my Gmail account online. I, I no no I will put that I'll okay. put the LinkedIn the LinkedIn yeah. page on uh, in the show notes. But tell them to put like a blurb when they reach out to me, not Perfect. just sort of say hey can you can you be my friend, but say hi I heard you on Papa PhD. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I'll do that. Okay. I will. Um, and uh, in terms of encouragement, yes, you can do it. Um, I've had times in not too distant past where I was sitting at my desk going, why am I here? I'm not doing. I don't know what I'm doing. This is totally the wrong place. Um, but that's okay. Um, go forward and know that there is an end. You have a goal in mind and finish it. So you know what you need to do. There are going to be times in your life all, all the time when you're doing horrible things um, that you don't love. But if there's a reason why you're doing it and there's a means to the end, just stick it through, put in the time and go for it. You can do it. Um, and things will get better. Things, And, you know, I, I remember thinking... Um, it, speaking to another colleague of mine who was a, also did her PhD, and she's like, I find that things aren't hard anymore. Um, and it's true, they're not hard. You just, you, you, you've cut up, you've, you, you know, you've, you've done your 24-hour protocols, you've written your 200-page thing, it's done. Um, and, and you finish it, and then things become, you can put things into perspective, you're like, yeah, I can do that. Sure, I can do that. But it takes a lot of slogging to get there. So, um, so, so go for it, do it. And it's not always beautiful, it's not always pretty, and it doesn't always make sense. Um, and sometimes the path is very windy, but that's a okay. Mm -hmm. Have faith and you'll be good. Yeah. <laughs> and there, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There is light. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, Katya, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really had a had a great time talking with you. I I, I can I was inspired by your your uh, kind of positive vibes, <laughs> and um, and I think that that your journey uh, can can be uh, in, of inspiration 
to not only uh, uh, women and girl who, girls who are thinking of going into science, uh, but who also have uh, you know other priorities in life, but for any young researchers who may be uh, wondering what's going to happen after graduation and who may be also dealing with this thing of maybe hiding something that they're doing on the side for for fear of uh, of of not being uh, considered in 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 opportunities that might arise in in the lab so thank you thanks a lot for for sharing merci beaucoup this was this is great <laughs> thank you very much it was it was my pleasure thank you thanks for listening to another episode of the papa phd podcast Head over to papaphd.com for show notes and for more food for thought about non-academic postgrad careers. I'll always be happy to share inspiring stories, new ideas, and useful resources here on the podcast. So make sure you subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts to always keep up with the discussion and to hear from our latest guests. Papa PhD.